the U.S. government that has been possible since 1970. Wow. I mean, so I've gone from 7 to now I'm 47, knowing about this fact. And at this point, I think now that two generations have passed, it's time to really tell the American people and the people of the world the truth, and that is that these technologies exist and that the U.S. government decided to keep them secret 40 years ago, notwithstanding the tremendous potential they, they hold to advantage all of humanity. Um, oh, so, I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, are there any repercussions to your sharing this information at this time? I think there are. Certainly, the project principals were concerned about speaking out because they've been threatened that they would be killed and also that their family members would be killed. Mm -hmm. I was warned by a representative of the executive office of the president during the uh, the first George W. Bush administration in a meeting mm -hmm. that was held um, in, in Colorado during one of my fact-finding trips uh, that, that if I continue to research, write about, or speak about my experiences in Project Pegasus, which mm -hmm. concern secret technologies and sensitive national security matters that were, that were to remain secret, they, quote-unquote, couldn't guarantee my survival. Hmm. But more recently, I had essentially covert meetings that resulted from the CIA and the NSA directing personnel towards me covertly, mm -hmm. putatively as clients in my law practice. In other words, they had people approach me posing as people in need of legal services, who I then became the lawyer for, and, and several of them basically briefed me on the fact that um, certainly here during the Obama administration, I was going to be green-lighted, and they wouldn't retaliate against me if I now step forward well, and thank describe goodness. my experiences in Project Pegasus and um, essentially the consequences of, 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 of the fact that the U.S. government developed this quantum access capability 40 years ago. So my understanding now is that I'm free to speak. And I've also decided not to live in fear. I mean, yeah, I've experienced yeah. a lot. I've had a good life. and I don't want to cling greedily to life and in right. the process of avoid fulfilling my destiny. So I've just decided to put fear behind me and, and move forward uh, courageously with my campaign to bring these truths to the people of our planet. Well, you certainly have my deepest uh, appreciation and admiration for what you're doing because uh, you're certainly on the forefront of probably the beginning of uh, a wave of people that will start coming out and sharing what they know, which, as you said, it's time and it's necessary. Um, aren't there implications with <clears throat> with going back? Now, there's so many questions it brings up uh, into the past that, uh, for instance, events that uh, maybe didn't happen the way that they're written in the history books. And uh, when you're actually there in a live time, does that affect the timeline that you're participating in, or are you kind of holographically superimposed on it? Well, that's a complex question, and it's a very good one, and I, I think it goes to the different forms of devices or uh, quantum access technologies that they were working with and what their effects were. Hmm. The chronovisors were essentially fields of supercharged particles. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the chronovisor was essentially propagating a hologram that was a dense field of supercharged particles okay. where we were essentially being superimposed superluminally over a past or present environment. Hmm. In other words... We, we were told, and I had interactions with people in the places we were sent to. In other words, we could interact with and be seen by the people in those locations. Wow. But again, as Jack Pruitt described, when we, he trained us on the chronovisor at Morristown, New Jersey, uh, which is in fact my, my place of birth, uh, there was an old building undergoing historical redevelopment there, and they put one of the chronovisor arrays in there, that we were merely a spectral presence in the past and future events we were being sent to. Right. So with chronovision, there was no danger of either of, let's say, affecting the, the, the past and then coming back and finding yourself in an alternate present. Right, right. The so things, butterfly things. effect. Yeah. Uh, when, we were, when we were teleporting, uh -huh. when we were teleporting, we were being physically sent there. And okay. so there was that danger implied by, you know, the problem of Schrodinger's cat, yeah. that if we were sent somewhere and we changed one of the preconditions of where we came from, the old, you know, what would happen if you went back and killed your grandfather problem, Right. They were concerned enough about that to instruct us, basically, when you're actually physically time-traveling, try as much as possible to honor the prime directive and not alter the conditions of the times that we're sending you to. Um, so there but was I don't integrity. Know any... Well, there, there, was there was a lot of integrity. Yeah, yeah. yeah there yeah. was a lot of integrity in this project. And, um, and I, they were also doing things where they were sending us to parts of the country where there wouldn't be an overlap. For example, right, right. 
you know, it was in the heart of the Southwest where I wasn't likely, let's say, to to vacation with my family during, let's say, the second the second summer of 1971 by going, you know, back to and seeing myself doing things during the first <laughs> summer of 1971. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so that control for some of the quantum paradoxes that that time travel implies. But I don't know of any serious uh, problem that resulted from somebody doing something when they were time traveling. I think that's uh-huh. more of a theoretical consideration than a practical one. Now, you went, you. what's the furthest into the future that you were able to go to uh, as far as the, our planet go is concerned? I think you went to 2013, didn't you? We went uh, in a form of virtual uh, time travel through a chronovisor array that was at the ITT Defense Communications building in Nutley, New Jersey, uh, which was adjacent to the Defense Logistics Agency, so it was involved in mapping the future for, for the U.S. military. We went superluminally on a technical remote viewing exercise to view the condition of the U.S. Supreme Court building in the year 2013. Mm-hmm. And what I reported to the Naval Intelligence Officer, the, the lieutenant commander in the Navy who debriefed me after that probe, was that I saw the building under about 100 feet of brackish water. So at <laughs> least on that timeline, there had been some ecological or other catastrophe where Washington, D.C. and the East Coast of the United States was under a lot of water. But, mm-hmm. of course, we know from my experiences in Project Pegasus that the multiverse exists. Mm-hmm. I mean, the reason they shut down time travel to the past, for example, was because when they sent the same kid or another kid to the same event in the past, it always changed a little bit. So we mm-hmm. don't know, based on that probe via chronovision, whether that discrete future will, will happen. Mm-hmm. Um, now that, And, again, that was just uh, virtual time travel where we were viewing what was there. Right. Now, later in the program, they developed these much larger devices I mean, the thing at Curtis Wright was just a little bit higher than an adult human being. Mm-hmm. But during the summer of 1972, they constructed this huge device uh, in a ba- on a basketball court at the cultural center in Cerritos, New Mexico. It was an old YWCA uh, facility with a mm-hmm. huge uh, full court, you know, basketball court, and they 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 built this huge 40 or 50 foot device. They were referring it to, to it as a stargate. And what we were doing as kids is we were running up this ramp and jumping huh. through the doorway that was filled with densely neon blue light, and we were teleporting forward to the year 2045. Wow. And we would then go into a building there, get data from the project personnel in 2045. We would then be taken to a conference room where they were having us jump through the wall because by 2045 the teleports were actually recessed into the building. Wow. And we would pop into view. We would then have one of these voidal tunnel experiences, and we would pop back into view in the grounds surrounding the microwave tower uh, at the Lobo Overlook site uh, in southwestern Colorado, and then be bumped wow. back. So that is the farthest. And I know that's the farthest I went to the future because, in point of fact, it's one of the only times I went to the future. I went there several times um, to gather microfilm summaries of intervening events. Essentially, we were giving the U.S. Defense Department the history of the future. Wow. And so there weren't many probes to the f- to the future, either via chronovision or teleportation. So for um, all those people that are concerned about 2012 and the end of time and the Mayan calendar, we do continue on into the future. Well, in fact, this is the, the American landscape, that I, as best as I could discern it, from popping into view in 2045 and Uh walking across this sort of industrial park area with people going by on their Sedgways, you know, Uh Dean Seaman's device, you know, his invention of the hit. There were actually people going by. Because I remember telling my dad when I got back from one of those probes, what are those things those people are standing on that look like uh, lawn fertilizers? (laughs) (laughs) You know, that's what it looked like to, to a kid from, you know, suburban New Jersey. I uh, uh, know those devices they have by then just get around like where they're working in a facility like that. Uh, and uh, so there are people going by on, on the front of the building on Sedgways. I thought that was kind of uh, di- disorienting to see that. But we yeah. would go inside the building and, and get, and get uh, microfilm scrolls and then take them back. And I'm telling you, from what I was able to see, the American landscape that was represented at that setting was essentially in a steady state ecology. It was like a a garden, a garden city in full bloom. It was a wow. beautiful environment. So for those wow. who are trepidatious about 2012 and what the future holds, I can confirm that the 2045 that I visited was a beautiful place and that 
people were prospering and involved in very, uh, you know, creative and, and technically sophisticated activities. Wonderful. Well, that's really good news. <laughs> yeah. Now, you went to some other places too, and and I'm I'm just dying to ask you about your time. You you've been at least once, right, to um, our, one of our local planets, to Mars. There's a base on Mars. Correct. Uh, there's at least one base on Mars because I was in it. But essentially, what happened is, I I did a lot of teleporting back and forth between New Jersey and New Mexico when I was in Pegasus. Mm. I would say at least forty times. Because wow. they were essentially trying to arrange these things and sort of dovetail them into our ordinary childhood. In fact, I had a wonderful childhood. Um, I have no regrets. I had a fantastic childhood just of a normal nature outside the project. Um, but, um, you know, so um, uh, I've lost my train of thought here. What, what was your question? Oh, well, about oh, Mars. Oh, Mars. Well, okay, anybody so the, would the project give, is, yeah. Yeah. Well, the anybody would give their in, left tooth to go to, to have the experiences that you've been able to have. Right. Actually, yeah, you, you asked about Mars. I I, um, I didn't really lo- want to go there, and so actually, I didn't. I, I viewed it as, as somewhat of a uh, of an intimidating prospect, just the idea of being on another planet. What happened was the project activities ended formally in 1972. Now we had access 1973 from fall of 71, but on my you know Alpha timeline in New Jersey, hmm. Pegasus kind of ended by the time I left the summer after fifth grade. And then our wow. family moved to California, and for those six years of junior high and high school, I had no intervention by the federal government in my life, you know, scientific, intelligence, military, or whatever. I was supposed to go to the Naval Academy, but declined, because mm. they were going to, as we learned from the, the defense attache, you know, attached to Project Pegasus, Donald Rumsfeld, they were okay. going to have all the kids, or at least some of the kids, go through the Naval Academy as a context for involving them in later project activities. But Mm. I decided I didn't want to go to the Naval Academy because I didn't want to basically be in the regimented world of the military or intel community again because there were some negative things serving in that context that I experienced as a kid that just didn't make it a very palatable option for me. Mm -hmm. And and so, um, however, um, I did have a couple interventions that related to the government attempting to correct things that had happened to me when, when I was on Pegasus. Oh. Really too, right, but I, I had a few teleportation experiences around 1980 just to correct some of the quantum displacement in my life that had resulted from a mishap that happened when I was on the project as a kid in 1971. Oh. Uh, but to explain that, we have to go into a pretty arcane discussion of quantum physics. But essentially what happened was, in 1980-81, they placed a CIA agent in my life by the name of Courtney M. Hunt. Now, Hunt's identity has been verified by a prominent ethicist who works with U.S. intelligence and military agencies, Mm -hmm. a scholar by the name of Dr. Jean Maria Arrigo, and also a whistleblower who was, in fact, the Army security attache to Project Pegasus, a U.S. Army captain by the name of Ernest Garcia, who was involved in many illustrious projects like this for the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And they placed Hunt in my life in 1980-81, as a kind of a a channel to the CIA. He was sort of, he wasn't handling me, but he was sort of briefing me, training me on some things that were coming, uh, but essentially somebody that was sort of a mentor that I could ask questions about how the U.S. intelligence community works. Oh, okay. And th- throughout the summer of 1981, Hunt kept plying me with a question that I really didn't even want to hear him ask, and that hmm. was, so what's your answer? Do you want to go to Mars? <laughs> and I finally said, Courtney, it's not that I don't want to teleport anymore. It's basically I don't want to go off planet. It just doesn't seem yeah. like a very, a very uh, hospitable. It's spooky. Uh, hospital. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's spooky. I mean, are my feet yeah. going to stay on the ground there? You know. Yeah. It's just, I mean, I remember initially asking him, "How am I going to get there via rocket?" And he looked at me like I was crazy. Because you know how we <laughs> pick people places, you know. Um, so, so what? What we ended up having a lot of discussions that summer. Like, look, are you going to go or not? You know, we want you to go to Mars. Uh-huh. And I finally said, "Why do I? Why should I go?" And he says, "He said because the the survival of the human race depends upon it." Really? And I thought about it, and I thought, "Well, if I'm even destroyed in the process of teleporting to Mars, at least I'm doing it for the right reason." And so I agreed to go. Okay. And one day there, in the sort of mid to late summer of 1981, he drove me to a CIA facility in El Segundo, California. We went up an elevator right in the front of the building and got out on about the fifth floor. Mm-hmm. And we walked in across 